Bishop, how are you? Well, Ron and yourself? <laughs> well, good. Thanks for being here. Blessed be God. And great to be in October, which is, of course, yeah. the month of the Holy Rosary. It's pro-life month. Lots lots going on. Lots going on. And <laughs> before we get to our gospel, how about let's talk some about lots going on. Sure. And really, the most one of the most significant things, folks, and I'm not sure exactly what time you might be uh, seeing or hearing this, but on the day that this airs, October 7th, will be our Cathedral and Diocesan Feast Day, which is, of course, the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. So I'm delighted that once again this year, as we have for the last number of years, really at least the last five years, we're really making it an effort to have a very special celebration at the Cathedral and bringing people from all around our diocese. And this year, Cardinal Dan Daniel DiNardo, the Cardinal Archbishop of Galveston, Houston, will be our celebrant. And as we always do, pray the rosary with him and with a family from the diocese, and then offer the mass of the feast day. So very excited. If you can join us, beautiful, from home, it will be live streamed, I'm sure. And if you can join us, if only to pray the rosary with us, beautiful, do that too. Mm. And then on a Saturday, October 9th, I'll be delighted. We talked about October being the month for life. So I have a mass and Eucharistic procession, which we've done over a number of years now. And that begins at St. Catherine's Church at 9 a.m. And we process to the last abortion clinic in the diocese in order to ask for an end to abortion and for the respect of the dignity and sanctity of all human life, starting with unborn babies. Then on also that Saturday in the evening, I'll be with Father John Miller. I'll be delighted to install him as pastor in St. Peter's in Mansfield. And on Sunday the next day, I'll be able to celebrate confirmation in that parish, St. Peter in Mansfield. And Ron, I marvel at folks who don't even know how large our diocese yes, is. I know. And when I talk I know. about Mansfield, they say, Bishop, is that in our diocese? Mansfield. And I say, you better believe it. It's a vibrant part of our diocese. So thank you for that. Uh, Monday the 11th in the evening. Folks, some of you know this every month. I'm very, very grateful and delighted and privileged to welcome six of our priests to my home, to the Episcopal residence, where we pray evening prayer together. We, as my dad would say, we have attitudinal adjustment. So we chat before dinner and then we have a dinner together. And it's just a wonderful way to bring our priests together from different generations, retired priests, active priests, older priests, younger priests. And it's so good simply to be able to have a meal together and share our own priestly lives. So that's on Monday the 11th. Wednesday the 13th, which is just before the next show, uh, actually, we have an Annunciation radio taping, Ron. Ah, that day. And then the same day, again, another life event. That evening is a, a foundation for life event at the in Perrysburg at the Hilton Garden Inn. So not a few things. Just a couple. And things. those are just oh, the highlights, Ron. I know. I know. Well, let's go to a recent gospel from Mark from the 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Pharisees approached Jesus and asked, Is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He said to them in reply, What did Moses command you? They replied, Moses permitted a husband to write a bill of divorce and dismiss her. But Jesus told them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. In the house, the disciples again questioned Jesus about this. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And people were bringing children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he became indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Amen, I say to you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Then he embraced them and blessed them, placing his hands on them. Your thoughts, Bishop? I think it's important, folks, obviously, to put this into a context, too, because this is one of those Gospels that when when you preach on a Sunday, it's very difficult, perhaps, sure. and also difficult for some people to hear, because it's it's the words of Jesus, and it concerns the sanctity 
of marriage, the union of a husband and wife. It concerns the question of divorce. And then lastly, you know, obviously it seems like a completely disjointed thought about children. But if I may just talk a, a little bit about this whole question that is raised, because it notice it's the Pharisees who raise it. And when the Pharisees raise it, and that's what we hear in the very beginning of that gospel. And Ron, could you share with me the text there? Absolutely. Thank you so much. In the beginning of that gospel, we hear the Pharisees approached and asked, is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? Obviously, they were trying to trip Jesus up regarding the law and what the law did or did not permit. And isn't it interesting that Jesus responds, but then when he goes into the house, then we hear, well, the disciples asked him this question. So isn't that true for us today? We hear what the church teaches about the sanctity of marriage. We hear that marriage is meant to be forever. It's meant to be fruitful. And yet there is the possibility that marriage fails at times for reasons perhaps that are unknown to people. And if marriage fails, there is the possibility in the church, not so much of something called divorce, which is exactly as Jesus says, but in annulments, we have the church recognizing that in essence, there was no real commitment capable in the before the people even tried to commit to each other as husband and wife. So that's just a simple way of saying, we hear all those things, and then how many people go back and talk in their houses about what the church says about a divorce and annulment and all the rest? I would simply say, especially to those folks who have experienced the sadness of divorce, and especially to the, those folks who desire to be married in the church, make a real concerted effort to contact your local priest, to contact a deacon perhaps, a lay friend who might have had an annulment themselves, or simply call our diocesan tribunal so that you might receive assistance and care regarding the sacrament of marriage. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Uh, let's get a question in here. Are we going to try to for our break? Throw one in yes, there. Yes, we are. We're Thank you. Go to Diane is Saint Anne in Fremont. Uh, dear Thank Bishop, you, Diane. Dear Bishop Thomas, why do we have to sing a communion hymn? Shouldn't we be praying to Jesus, who we just received? Wouldn't it be better to have an instrumental song during communion? Thanks, Diane. Well, Diane, I guess that's a loaded question, uh, but I, you know, I would. Uh, cancel out the advice given to me by Sister Joanna in sixth grade here, Diane, and that was never answer a question with a question. But Diane, I'd ask you the question, isn't singing a communion hymn praying? Because in most cases, the hymn is a prayer at communion time. So that'd be my first response to you. You say, shouldn't we be praying? Well, the communion hymn should be prayer. Now, that having been said, and go right to the sources, Diane, go to the general instruction to the Roman Missal and look at number 86, and it speaks about when the priest is receiving the sacrament, the communion chant is begun. This is what the documents of the church say, Diane. Its purpose being to express the spiritual union of the communicants by means, listen, Diane, of the unity of their voices to show gladness of heart and to bring out more clearly the communitarian character of the procession going up to receive the Eucharist. The singing is prolonged for as long as the sacrament is being administered to the faithful. However, if there is to be a hymn after communion, the chant should be ended in a timely manner. So, Diane, why do we have a communion hymn? That's what the Church invites us to do, because the Mass is not a solitary, individual, I'm an island event. It's a communitarian prayer where we come together in the communion of the church with one another at Mass. And then, of course, in number 87 of the general instruction, it simply talks about the fact that the different dioceses and different countries are governed by what the bishops in those countries offer. And Diane, you should know that the singing at communion can take any number of Reality. So it can be the antiphon from the Missal. It could be the antiphon with the psalm from the Gradawali Simplex. It could be a chant from another collection of psalms. It could be a suitable liturgical chant, or it could be some song approved for celebration at that time. So I guess I would ask 
a question to your question, Diane, first, and that is, isn't our singing at communion supposed to be a prayer? And then secondly, to direct you to the instruction of the Roman Missal, where you can find it's the church herself who tells us why we sing at communion time. You know, and, and I really appreciate your answer because I, I sympathize with and empathize with her. Um, I think after communion, I personally fight that battle all the time. You, you, you sure. go back there and, and I guess where I think where she's coming from, from that last point, wouldn't it be better to have an instrumental? Sometimes um, mm -hmm. music can be almost a uh, background for us that doesn't interfere with us. It's, it's just reflective. Sure. And again, there are many variations, Ron, that can take place. So, for example, the communion antiphon could be chanted. And then yeah. there could be instrumental music. Sure. Yeah. But she's asking specifically yeah. about singing. Understand? I, and I, I get it. And I appreciate your your comment that the singing is a prayer. And that's yeah. what it's intended to be. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Well, thanks for the question, Diane, Diane. Thank you much. Thank you, Bishop. We have to take just a quick break. Don't go anywhere, because we, Bishop, we have more questions that we're going to get to. Here. I can't wait. <laughs> Come back, folks. Annunciation Radio is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo. Serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years, Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. And we're back here at the Bishop's Corner. So glad you're with us, folks. We're with Bishop Daniel Thomas. Folks, we are always anxious and eager to get your questions. Um, several ways you can get them to us. Just go to the AnnunciationRadio.com and click on the Bishop's Corner. A little Apple uh, template will pop up. You can put your question in there. Uh, you can text us. I mean, a lot of ways to get them to us. Uh, we do ask, maybe you give us your first name and the parish you're from or the town you're from or something like that so the bishop has some idea who he's speaking with. Uh, we do do our best to get them all on. If you don't hear your question on a specific show, just keep watching the next shows, and you probably will get to hear it at some point. Uh, bishop, we're going to go to Patrick at Holy Angels down in Sandusky, who says, Dear Bishop Thomas. Thank you, Patrick, for writing in. I noticed the bishop's post from going to the Solheim Cup in Toledo. <laughs> Thanks for following my Facebook page, Patrick. <laughs> my question is, with Sundays being a holy day of obligation, aren't professional golfers that work or play Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning without going to Mass, aren't they in a constant state of mortal sin? Uh, supposedly Phil Mickelson was raised Catholic and Rory McIlroy is a Catholic. Thanks, Patrick. So, Patrick, I must confess to you from the get-go that I, I was a little surprised at your question because it just seems to be a judgment of golfers. <laughs> and I guess I would ask the question, Patrick, do you know that these persons do not go to Mass? So, for example, you, you indicate professional golfers that work slash play Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, without going to Mass, aren't they in a constant state of mortal sin? Patrick, I guess my question would be, could they not have gone to Mass at 6.30 a.m. on Sunday in a local parish? Could they not have gone to Mass at 6 p.m. in a parish? And there are many of our parishes that have Sunday evening Masses. So, Patrick, I must confess that I wouldn't be so ready to stand in judgment of anyone unless you know absolutely that they have in fact, abandon the practice of going to Mass. I, for one, Patrick, know when I've celebrated early Masses in some parishes, I see the parishioners come in dressed in their golfing clothes. In fact, Patrick, one time there was a man who had his golf cleats on. This was yesteryear. And you could hear him coming up the aisle because of his golf cleats on the stone floor. So I think, Patrick, I would simply say, certainly, if someone is avoiding and refuses to go to Sunday Mass, well, then that's serious sin. But I guess I'd also say, Patrick, there are a lot of people who might miss Mass for one reason or another. And Patrick, we know there is always the sacrament of penance and reconciliation to offer sorrow for that sin, to be reconciled to God, and to get to Mass the next weekend. 
So that's how I would try to answer that question. But I want to end by saying, Patrick, thanks so much for following me on Facebook. And I have to tell you, I was so grateful to receive from a friend passes to go to the Solheim Cup. And I was delighted to be able to be there. It was a, an extraordinary local event. It was an event that highlighted the Inverness Club, Toledo, Ohio, our region. Yeah, yeah. And I just thought it was a great gathering of folks. It was To me, it was like a, a big block party, a big parish block party. So before we go to our next question, though, so when you do early Sunday morning mass and you see plaid pants and pink shirts, you're assuming maybe I, so they're maybe, going golfing. May, I, you know, I, maybe I assume that they're golfers, Ron. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, too funny. Great question. Okay, so we're going to go to Bill in Bowling Green, dear Bishop Thomas. According to Reformed theologians like Karl Barth, sin precedes the fall of Adam and is not a lapse or a series of lapses in a man's life, but rather has a pre-existent state before its physical manifestation in the flesh. He quotes Barth's Epistle to the Romans, page 173. I was wondering if this view is in line with Catholic teaching on sin. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Bill. So, Bill, thank you, obviously, for a very... Uh, theological question, I, I guess, and I just want to qualify in, in the parenthetical to your question, Barth's Epistle to the Romans. I'm presuming, Bill, that you mean this is Barth's, Karl Barth's commentary on the Epistle to the Romans. Right. So I imagine that's what it might be. Uh, that's what I'm guessing. But obviously, the first thing we have to respond to is remember now that a Reformed theologian is not Catholic. So I think we have to say that right out front. And certainly it is true that sometimes a, a theologian who is not Catholic, it may be that their, their thinking might dovetail somehow with Catholic theology. But obviously, Karl Barth is a Reformed theologian. He is not a Catholic theologian. And that's helpful for us to keep in mind. I think, uh, you know, go to the sources, Bill. So this is where I would direct you. Go right to the Catechism of the Catholic Church and I simply would direct you to Numbers 374, 375, 402 to 406, and look at the fact that these are the types of things which we hear. 375, the Church, interpreting the symbolism of biblical language in an authentic way, in light of the New Testament tradition, teaches that our first parents, Adam and Eve, were constituted in an original, quote, state of holiness and justice. This grace of original holiness was to share in divine life. So I'm thinking, Bill, that that is the best answer to your question because you talk, of, you talk about it, a pre-existent state of sin prior to the manifestation in the flesh. If that were the case, I don't think that this teaching would be in the catechism that says this was a grace of original holiness as a result of their creation. So I think that's it in a nutshell. And then if you look at number 403, I mean, the letter to the Romans, you can see 403 is about St. Paul and 405, etc. So I think that's where I would lead you, especially regarding original sin in each individual as the result of the fall of Adam and Eve. I hope yeah, that's helpful. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks, Bill, for the question. Uh, let's go to Mark at St. Patrick's. Dear Bishop, uh, what would you like people to know or appreciate about the institutional church? Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much. So, Mark, that is a very interesting question, and I guess I would simply have to ask, I'm not so sure what you're trying to get at, hmm. because what to appreciate about the institutional church well, the church herself is an institution founded by Christ Jesus, founded on the apostles. So I, I don't really, I, I, I wish you had added a little more to the question. I'm sorry, Mark, because I wish I could help you a little more. So when, when you ask, what, what should people know and appreciate about the institutional church? It's what they should know, appreciate about the church of Christ. That is the Catholic church. And if that's the case, then they should know and appreciate what we, for example, again, go to the sources, go right to the catechism, what we profess every Sunday in the creed. The church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Then I would say, gosh, I think of the church, and again, I don't make a distinction, institutional church, 
over and against or versus some other version of church. No, the church in her nature is institutional because she was instituted by Christ. So I think, Mark, that the church is our mother. The church is the bride of Christ, for example. And then I would suggest, you know, there are models of church. Go to Cardinal Avery Dulles, a very popular book for, for years and years and years and still holds, is still taught what are the models of the church that he suggested. And especially, what is the church? I would direct you right to Vatican II. So the Second Vatican Council, the Constitution, the dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium, what is the church, and the pastoral constitution on the church in the martyr world, Gaudium et Spes. So those would be the places, and in the catechism itself, I would suggest, Mark, that the catechism will help you to understand who she is, that is, who is the church in relationship to Christ, how is she made up in the people of God, the hierarchical structure of the church founded on the apostles. I hope that's a way of getting to an answer to your, your question. And I hope I'm, I'm certainly not to, trying to avoid this question because institutional church means to me, the church instituted by Christ, which is the Catholic church. All right. Thank you. Let's thank you, Mark. One more in here, Bishop quick. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll go to Jean at St. Pius, uh, the 10th in Toledo, uh, dear Bishop Thomas. Uh, I want to responsibly plan for my future, but I'm worried that if I invest in the stock market, I will be an owner in companies that are doing immoral things as a Catholic. How can I be smart with my money without doing evil with it? Thank you, Jean. Jean, thank you so much. And what an excellent question. And blessed be God. First, Jean, that you uh, you have means enough to be able to put some money away. And, and that's a great blessing. So thanks be to God for that. And that you would want to do good with your investment. What a blessing. Now, the simple answer is in planning well, and that's a great thing too. You know, we, we recommend that people plan well for the future. And that's something people really need to do, right? By by not squandering their money, by putting money away for the future, for future needs. And the singular answer I would direct you to, Gene, is to go to the USCCB website, that is the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops website, on socially responsible investment guidelines. So I can tell you, Gene, I know that there are a number of investment advisors that I am aware of who themselves are Catholic and who know in trying to guide their clients about the investment of their monies, they try to help them to invest in those places where they are socially responsible. By that, they mean that they are not investing in things that are antithetical to the Catholic faith or to the moral life. So we're not investing in companies which you know have ties to uh, you know abortive patients. That would just be a sim simple example. And um, you say stock market. Well, that the person would have to help you to see whether or not that company in which you are investing, if they themselves are involved in activities which are counter to what the church teaches or believes. All right. Very good, Bishop. Thank you. Thanks, Gene, for the question. Thank we're you, Gene. Time. I don't know how we're out of time. We had another question yeah, on the dock. Yeah, no, we're we never make it. I know. All right. Could we get a prayer and a blessing, please? Thank you. So let's pray, folks, the collect from the Sunday which, from which we took the gospel. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who in the abundance of your kindness surpass the merits and the desires of those who entreat you, pour out your mercy upon us to pardon what conscience dreads and to give what prayer does not dare to ask. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you so much, Ron. And thanks to our viewers and listeners. We so appreciate your being with us on the Bishop's Corner. And this is where we do evangelization, information, <laughs> and answer anything they ask. A little entertainment, hopefully. <laughs> we'll see you again right here next week. Thanks, everyone. Bishop's Corner. Blessings. <laughs>